Well, without any further ado, we have a very special guest. Well, we have a lot of special guests, but th this particular guest, her name is Dr. Rebecca McLeod, and she is a professor of music ed at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. She recently published a book called Teaching Strings for Today's Classroom, and she was recently elected the president-elect for the American String Teacher Association, and she's here to talk to you about the ASTA guidelines for teaching in COVID-19, among several other things. So without any further ado, Rebecca McLeod. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And then hopefully I have some things that can help people as we all navigate uh, teaching during COVID-19. I think for, uh, and just to double check, John Ryan, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, great. I just want to make sure everything's working. Um, so we're all kind of in this new reality and you're all streaming in from different parts of the United States and I understand we even have some people that are coming in internationally and everybody finds themselves in a very different kind of scenario where your district, your teaching needs are very specific to where you are. And so I'm going to try to go through some guiding principles today that can maybe help you. I hope they will. And also just provide a little bit of reassurance. I think that no one has the answers right now, but that our students still need music and they absolutely still need you. So see if I can get, okay, good. Um, I was just uh, elected president-elect of the American String Teasers Association. And in that role, my first task was to lead the development of guidelines for resuming instruction during COVID-19. So the first thing I wanna share with you are those guidelines if you have not seen them. So I believe I, I gave this to John Ryan, Dr. Zabinal before we began, and you can access these on the ASTA website. If you're not yet a member, uh, these guidelines are still av available to everyone. Um, but I will say that right now in this moment is probably the most important time to join professional organizations so that we have strength in our numbers and our ability to advocate for our students and for one another. So there are two um, large guidelines that we created and one is for classroom instruction and the other is for studio instruction and both uh, include some of the same information but tailored a little more specifically to different people's environments if you come on to the asta website there will be additional documents being added and additional resources so just you have that maybe to look forward to see if I can go back to my got yeah, worked pretty well so as the task force was creating this guideline we really had to think about some major goals that we wanted string teachers to have and one is that regardless of your scenario whether you're face to face whether you're online exclusively or whether you find yourself in this hybrid situation uh, we wanted to center the idea that active music making as a part of a community should remain our priority. And that can be difficult to do because in the face-to-face -face instruction, we're going to have probably face masks. Some people are recommending goggles. I'll get into some of those details. We're going to have things that kind of are interfering and disrupting our ability to connect. But what we learned in the spring was more than anything else, our students desired community. They want the relationship they had with you and they want the relationship that they had with their peers. And so probably one of the most important things you can do is simply maintain contact and communication with your students and allow them time with one another. We had this uh, big launch of the online virtual performance, and those experiences are valid 
in one way, but they don't recreate that active music making. And so the question is, as we move online, how can we recreate that sensation of getting to play with others or at least interact with others? So active music making should remain a priority. Um, curriculum continuity should and can be maintained. And, and what we meant by that was we still have standard based instruction. So I guess one of the things is everybody take a kind of their deep breath and say, things aren't going to be the way they were and kind of let that sink in. Um, in my conversations with people, one of the most frequently asked questions is how are we going to basically do what we always did before? And the answer is, well, we're, we're not going to be able to do that, not the return to normal, at least not right in this moment. But we can do things and, and even think about how to improve instruction. We're in a place right now in society where we are being asked to deeply reflect on issues that have been in our curriculum for years, things that have impacted our inclusivity, our engaging students from all backgrounds and from all races and ethnicities. And so this really provides us this powerful time to reflect on how we might improve instruction. And by the nature of being completely disrupted by COVID, we have this opportunity, even a forced opportunity to say, what is it that I can do as a string teacher to meet the needs of every kid in my classroom and maybe even the needs of kids who have not yet elected my classroom? So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Assessment, the way you assess your students and how you deliver instruction may need to be modified. That's probably likely. I'm definitely facing, just from my personal standpoint, the first nine weeks of instruction for my public school students. I have two community partnerships and we serve um, two Title I schools. And that instruction for my beginners is going to be exclusively online for nine weeks. So I am gonna talk about some plans for that. Um, at the university level, with my own personal university orchestra, our instruction is going to be hybrid. So I'm going to have some online modules as well as some in-person learning. Differentiating instruction is going to be really important. Being able to adapt to each child's needs in this environment in so many ways, not just in the level of music, but in what you're asking them to do. And right then I'm talking about equity and access. This new online world that we're in is really bringing to light issues in equity and access that were always there but can be compounded by and even like multiplied by issues with technology and available resources. So as we start to plan and figure out how we're gonna navigate this environment, we really have to think and ask ourselves over and over, can students access my materials? And, and which students can, and if students cannot, what are their barriers? And just a quick personal story, when COVID hit, those that of you, I saw some uh, faces already know me, those of you that know me well know that one of my coping mechanisms to stress is to simply work a, a bit more. So my personal reaction to COVID-19 was to make as many instructional materials as I could. I made about a hundred online videos, which at the end of the session, I'm going to give to you for free, uh, for your use. You can use them. I hope they help someone. And in my frenzy, all of a sudden I realized that bandwidth and technology and accessibility really impacts whether students can access my videos. And the better and more beautiful you make your online instruction, in all likelihood, the less accessible it is. And not only that, kids prefer synchronous instruction. So I guess if you don't take anything else away from my time in this meeting, and I'm going to talk about some asynchronous things that I think are helpful, but they really crave synchronous time even if we think it's a little less effective in terms of the quality of sound, going through the image, going through the speakers, the reality is those kids, it goes back to community, 
want time interacting with people. So if we keep that at the forefront, it's going to really help you design instruction. Okay, so let me get to my next slide. All right. Um, some of you may, I hope you can see, uh, uh, John Ryan, can you see this picture? Yes, I can. Okay, great. This is the Elizabeth Green Orchestra Box. Um, it's an older, older photo, used to go through the ASTA community for a while. And I think it's such a great um, little pictorial representation of what we might be thinking about in our face-to-face -face instruction. And you'll take a look in, in this particular photo. Um, the students are spaced out well in the columns. They actually need some more space between them. But if they had a little bit more space, they would be able to maintain a six foot distancing. And you'll notice in the video that, or in the photo, that they each have their own music stand. They're not sharing materials. They're all seated facing forward. And these are all important. The only thing they're missing are our COVID masks, I think. So here are some of the things that, regardless of what research you're looking at, people have come to kind of agree upon this, which is we want to maintain a six foot of distance. We want to wear face masks. We want to arrange students perpendicular to the airflow. So before you go in your classroom, if you're doing face-to-face -face instruction, figure out where your vent is. And if the airstream is coming this you know, towards me, then it's going to be blowing any aerosols around or behind me. And I guess I'll hit pause here because there's been a lot of research done recently and conversation on the dangerous place that is social media and the wonderful place that is social media about how COVID is spread. And at least with the task force um, investigations and research that we did, which you can find a beautiful um, collection of all of the research references authored by Kirk Moss. And what we think we know about the virus spread is that there's three ways of, of possible spread. There's droplets, which are the visible things that you can see when someone coughs or sneezes. There's aerosol, which is small enough that we can't see it, but it still has liquid or solids in the moisture that's being dispersed in the air. And then there's what they call fomites, which is actually your surface, if something's dropped on surface. So that's important to know because those three things impact us in our classroom. So doing our regular hygiene is gonna be important. Arranging students perpendicular to the airflow is a tactic that is being suggested to reduce aerosol. So once that aerosol is put out in the air, we can't see it and it will stay there. And we need to get the, the rooms ventilated. This is why everyone's recommending opening the doors, opening the windows, disinfecting frequently touched surfaces. The American Pediatric Academy of Pediatrics is actually recommending eliminating frequently touched surfaces rather than disinfecting if you can by leaving doors and windows open. Of course, we know in school systems, sometimes there are no windows and that's not possible. Um, but if you can, arrange the students perpendicular to airflow. Uh, they're also recommending that you sit the students facing the same direction. And that's something that you can see in this particular uh, photo. The arcs allow people to, again, start to expend the airflow towards one another. So we're really recommending the social distancing and the arcs. And reduce sharing items, reduce sharing instruments, eliminate sharing stands and music. At my own university, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, um, we're locking away all our music stands. We're not going to disinfect them. Students are being asked to bring their own. Again, you've got to deal with issues of equity and access, so it may be that you need to disinfect your music stands, but uh, if it's possible, reduce sharing as, as much as you can. Okay, probably, I can't see the chat, that's by design. I'll have Dr. Zabinal at the end uh, float me some questions, but everybody on this call who's a string teacher is probably wondering how you sanitize your instruments. And I saw this, uh, this photo floating around and it just really tickled me because, well, there it is. How are we going to do this? Well, 
I don't have the best news for you. I do have a link. So again, if you go to the ASTA website, you can find the resources on um, desanitizing instruments. The reality is this. Products that actually kill the virus contain enough alcohol or other chemical that it will damage the varnish. So the recommendation is you can disinfect the, the metal surfaces, you can disinfect um, the fingerboard, it may be the pegs, but that when we're dealing with the varnish and the wood of the instrument, anything that's going to disinfect the instrument is also going to damage the instrument. So we're kind of in this difficult situation. One thing that we do know, and this is the route that I'm personally taking, is that the virus on wood surfaces has about a three-day expiration. So my plan with most of my instruments is to give them to students who will have them for a period of time, and we're actually going to go on a wheel rotation. So let's say they get eight weeks of instruction, then they return the instrument, I allow the virus to expire, reset them up, and now the next cohort of students will get to use the instruments. And that way I'm not damaging the instruments. Now I did choose this photo of these soap suds. And I'm going to say this with so much caution, string teachers, just, um, John Ryan, is this being recorded? Yes, it is. Well, there it is. I've saw, this is going to haunt me for all my days, but I'm going to go for it. So we've had a lot of talks with luthiers. I strongly suggest that you talk to your luthier. Um, but we've had a number of luthiers say that if you absolutely have to on your more expensive inexpensive instruments, your inexpensive instruments that have more kind of laminate varnish on them, that the best thing to do or the least damaging thing, so maybe I won't call it the best, the least damaging thing is to actually take baby soap, which is a very gentle soap and a lightly damp cloth because bubbles break up the lipids of the virus and you can clean the surface. That's why it's effective for hand washing. And so that is probably the least destructive thing to do to the surface. Now, this photo is what you absolutely should not put the violin in a sink and, and make it this bubbly because it will, will damage the surface. Okay, so many of you are going to find yourself in the scenario of online instruction. And if you're like me, that's happening. So the first thing, well, the first thing you want to think about, again, is community. I have to teach online. How can I build a community? Before we jump into the panic of what they're going to learn and what standards they're going to meet, I would suggest we step back and think about the things that we would probably do on the first day of our class in person, which would be introduce ourselves to one another. So think about what are some ways, if you're online, that you can create an engaging environment that people, students want to be part of. Is there a way for them to contribute to the online space that you're going to be making together? Um, one of the things I've considered doing is having students put up a story or a picture or even submit a link of their, their favorite music that's been approved for lyrics, maybe vetted through me, so that they have a way to respond and interact and get to know one another and you. Mm -hmm. um, once, once you've done that, and I think that's so important, deciding whether you can, how much you can do synchronously which I keep advocating for. The research all tells us that synchronous is powerful across the, the web conferences. And I know in music that seems difficult, but there are some things that people reported that worked pretty well in the spring. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of them here. I did what I called my Zoom tour. And that meant that every couple days I met in the evening with groups of teachers from around the United States and just asked them to talk to me about what worked and what their participation rate was. And by and large, the people who had the most students still participating at the end of the last school year online were those who had synchronous interactions. And here are some of the things that they did. Um, they did a lot of, I'm the teacher, I'm gonna play, and everybody at home mute. 
play along with me. They allowed for student leadership by having one student at a time unmute and they would count off and play and everybody in the class would play along. For those of you that are in hybrid situations, we've been um, trying to figure out, and it's working okay, one of my plans is to bring in just my principal players, this would work maybe at the high school level, social distance in the face-to-face -face setting with just four players in a large space, and have everybody else at home zoom in, hit mute, and play along with the rehearsal. Now most of the, it, this would be like a master class style, but that would be a way to do some synchronous instruction. Asynchronous instruction can also be really powerful because if everything's synchronous, talking about equity and access, you're going to have people whose internet go out. Probably already we've lost people from the call who are trying to get back in. So providing also some asynchronous supports that students can access at any given time is a way to fill in some of those holes. How can we increase accessibility? Well, one way is by having a number of different ways that students can participate, whether that's online, synchronous online, some in person, some asynchronously. It also has to do with making lower production materials that students can access. Again, back to my fancy videos, it ends up some of the things that I was doing with sound and trying to increase the quality was actually making it inaccessible. And then I was having to go and, and compress the video files so that they could stream better. Um, one thing you can consider doing is creating student online groups to increase motivation. Provide time for students to interact with each other, even if that's not musical, even if it's decision making. So they can do musical activities, but maybe they can't play simultaneously online. There is a new app that I just discovered online called Upbeat. I'll find it right at the end here and, and zoom it out to you guys. It allows the students to record while they're all in the same room together. They can't hear one another when they record, but they can make decisions together, record, and then the um, software actually compresses together a video that they can then take a look at. This is a big one, short videos. If you're online only and you're creating short videos for them, they, well, they need to be short. Students can really only attend about their age so if they're 12, 12 minutes would probably be max. Um, and actually, none of us are very good at attending longer than about 15 minutes. And most of us online prefer something that's five minutes or less. So that's another thing. Be really kind to yourself as you create whatever instructional materials. Make sure that they're short and then allow the student an opportunity to interact with the material. Interactive videos are better than just instructional videos that seem like a lecture. <laughs> what I'm doing right now is an example of a lecture, uh, but although with as many people as we have here, this is our best uh, opportunity. But interactive videos are better, even if that means that you say, it's my turn to play, and now you play, and there's space or time while you whisper in the video. Um, I'll show you an example of that too before the end. Okay, beginning instruction. I think this is the thing that terrifies most string teachers, myself included. And one of the issues right now is I'm going to give you some of my ideas that I've put together with the complete disclosure that I have not done this yet. Um, and people haven't done this yet. We're all kind of leading up to what it's going to be like to meet kids for the first time online if that's the situation you're in. So here are some things just to consider. How will kids know that your program exists if it's an elective program? So consider how you're going to do your recruitment. I think the most powerful recruitment for any program are the kids themselves. 
So have your older students create a video welcoming younger students into the program. And they, they're probably happy to do it. How can you have online signups? I'm personally thinking about a Google, Google form, a way to get people to sign up so that we don't have to interact face to face. This one's huge. I'm going to spend a second here. Everyone has been talking about communication and increasing communication. But communication only works if it's two way. And what happened in the spring for a lot of areas was lots of information got pushed out. I know that my email box was, I couldn't absorb or look at any more helpful posts about anything because it was all just coming in a flood. And it wasn't two ways. It was coming at me, but it didn't require a response on my end. So when we think about how we're gonna increase our communication, think about how it can be two way. Think about asking the community, asking your students and asking the students' families how they are and what they need and whether the materials are working. For sizing of instruments, the uh, ASTA guidelines recommend just using the yardstick approach for now, and you can find measurement tools online, just you Google it, because physically sizing students right now is, is difficult. If your district allows you to do that, and if you personally feel comfortable doing that, and the students feel comfortable, then you could meet in a large area with lots of open space or schedule smaller meetings. Then we need a plan for instrument distribution. Okay, if you, like some of us are panicking a little right now, my plan actually is to create a unit of musicianship activities and I have a instrument kit I'm gonna send home with my beginners so that I personally as a teacher have built in time to get the instruments ready and organized. So I would reach out to administration as soon as you can. I've reached out, I've worked with two different sets of principals. I've reached out to both and asked, we're the specials, just to give you a little context, I meet my students twice a week. I've asked for time to kind of get ready as they're negotiating all the changes they're going through to clean the instruments which we happen to own. So perhaps you have an instrument dealer and your students rent, in which case you can really work with the dealer to figure out how to get the instruments set up with everything you need and in tune and do a student pickup, instrument drop off, instrument meet up, or if you're like me, then you own the instruments, the school. My plan is to clean them up, set them up, and then allow them to be quarantined for their three-day period. The virus expires, and then I'm going to have parents meet to get the instruments. Here's my concept. John Ryan, is this big enough to see? Uh, on my screen, yes, but maybe on other people's screen, no. I'm not sure. We can't tell. This is. I'll tell you guys about it. Can you see me on your screen? On the, on the top since it's in the presenter. Okay, I might get out of my, I'll go over this and get out of my view for a minute. So this is how to make a string starter kit. And I have a little photo here. We've got a little box violin. We've got a dowel bow rod. We've got a dowel rod bow, sorry. Um, this is, uh, do I have this here? This is just shelving paper that I rolled up. This is gonna be the shoulder rest. The straw is there. We've got a bowing tube cup. This is a little corn pad. This is a bow buddy. And these are all things I found in my home. I'm gonna stop my screen share for one second so you guys can mostly see me. Hopefully I'm in your speaker view right now. Okay, can we, how are we? Thumbs up, thumbs down, okay. Actually, some people oh. are messaging me that one person said she's on an iPad and the screen view's fine, so there's that too. Oh. Okay, well, all right. So. I woke up one morning and I, in, in a fit of terror, said to myself, how am I going to start these beginners? This is going to be, 
this is going to be crazy. And I ran around my house and made a little box violin. I am a violinist, if you don't know me. I, um, because I know I have a bass back here, but if you're a string teacher, you probably have string instruments. I have these six string instruments in this room, so sort of that's just what we do, right? I started violin when I was six, and I was a Suzuki kid, and I had my little cereal box violin with a roller taped on. So I, I found a box, and I went ahead, and actually, I think you could, like, let your kids be part of this. I think I'm going to go ahead and send home the materials and have the kids put their own together with the help of their family to try to really create, like, some interactive stuff. We'll have, you know, our little violin craft time. My art skills are not good, but I took my little half-size violin and lined it up next to this, and I just drew on my chin rest and drew on my strings, drew on my F holes, and I'm thinking, like, what a great way to teach them in the first lesson just the parts of their instrument. We'll just draw them because they don't even have their instruments yet, at least in my world, because I'm still struggling with all the million thousand things I'm going to have to do to make this work. Okay? I put a little corn pad here at the bottom because I wanted an end button because I'm really scared about these beginners online. And I think I, I, I use that word scared. And I, I think if, if we're not sort of afraid of it, then, well, I just, it's, it is scary. I'm trying to think about why would you wouldn't be afraid because we already see what they look like in the classroom. I mean, you try to start 20 beginners and, you know, they're all looking like goodness. And now I'm going to try to start them online. I mean, I just, they're going to, by the way, my beginners are fourth graders. And the younger you go, I mean, those of you that teach the little, little ones, I mean, I just don't even know. I just don't, you need a different presenter for that because I just don't even know. I've been teaching my niece. I just started her because I thought I would, you know, maybe try this out on her. She's seven. The only way to make it work is to have a parent who's really willing to pay very close attention and, and take over my role on that end. At any rate, I got a little end button here so that they can, I'm thinking, feel where I want them to put this box violin on their shoulder. And then you can't really see, but I have like instructions, like put your chin here. Like I realized, ooh, I can draw on the box. Like put your hand here. So this is also in the kit. It's just shelving paper. I realized I need just a little bit of support to get my own little box violin up. For the fingerboard, I just took index paper and rolled it up like literally, because again, I'm not a very craftsy person. And then I put some rubber bands on it. And then I did do the spacing for the first finger pattern. And I do have to tell you that actually it, it feels, it feels pretty all right. I have my left hand here. I made a little hole in the box. Um, and we can get set up like that. So that was one idea. And then I thought, well, my cello and basses, I don't think I can quite make a box instrument for them. So what I did was I took another, um, well, I took a paper towel roll and then I covered it in index, you know, index paper and I drew their strings on it, labeled the strings and I put their thumb position on the back so they'll know if they're cello that the thumb's gonna go across from their second finger and I put their little finger markers on here because I do think that they can practice singing and fingering and shaping their left hand. And then I realized that for the bass, it's actually really nice. And I'll probably use this in my classroom from now on to create a really nice K position by getting their hand formed on, on a tube first. All right, my favorite tool in the whole world, in person or otherwise, doesn't matter, is the straw, milkshake straw, the cheap ones. Yeah, don't get the expensive ones. You have to get one that's flexible so that if they squeeze, they can feel it. Because again, what are we afraid about with these beginners on these string instruments? Well, I'm afraid they're going to be tense, they're going to squeeze, their formation is going to be messed up, and they're not going to be successful. So the straw gives you 
instantaneous feedback. If they squeeze, it will bend, okay? Um, and it's nice and light, and we can do a lot of flexibility exercises. My students in my elementary program have to be able to make their straw hold in order to get their license to bow. And I literally printed licenses. And then after I did licenses, I realized that we also needed permits. So first they get a permit, and then that means they can make their bow hold on their bow. And then after their bow holds really beautiful on their bow, they get their license and then they, they keep it in their instrument case. And not everybody has a license um, yet. My good friend, David Pope, uh, was saying to me the other day, he took this idea and got different colored straws. And I'm not even sure if he tells the students, but the different colors mean that there are different levels. So like, you know, the blue straws really need help. The yellow straws are a little better. And then if you have a red straw or a green straw means go. And he's like, it really makes it easy for him to assess in a group very quickly because he just has to count how many colors of each straw he has and, and go with that. Okay. So <laughs> this is my favorite tool. Um, this is the dowel rod bow. And I need to make sure that I can, oh, that y'all can see. So I'm obsessed by this thing, again, in person, online, or otherwise. I, I just am going to use this for the rest of all time. It is new to me. I got this from Dr. Ann Witt at the University of Alabama. I was in her office, and I saw these, and I said, what is that? In great excitement. And what she had done was gotten dowel rods, and I've been using dowel rods for a while to teach my bow arm. This dowel rod is starting to warp. Anyway, I guess that makes it more realistic. A lot of them have warped bows. I got a warped dowel. Okay, not good. All right, so what this is, is I've rubber banded a clothespin to the bottom. So it's the frog. And just like the box, I wrote things, and you probably can't see that. It says thumb, and then it has an X outside the frog mouth. It has a little marker here for the finger. And so they can make their bow hold on this dowel. It actually feels a lot like a bow to me. And I think you saw in my little kit, I had a, you know, a bowing tube. Then I put some musical stuff on it. And so the idea is that they can practice some of their motions. And this works for cello and bass. I just need to rotate where I'm holding the dowel. Okay, one more thing with this dowel rod bow. Um, it has to be an eighth inch diameter for it to for the next thing to work. I'll just say that again, one eighth inch diameter. My dowel rod bow is the length of a full size bow, but you could certainly make it the length of whatever bow you need. Um, just measure the bows, but a full size bow, uh, no, I already forgot. I think I wrote it on my take home sheet. How many inches? Nope, I didn't. Okay, well, you can, well, it's easy to look up online. Um, but what you do here is take the straw, take the straw and put the bow wherever you, you know, if you're a violinist, it's gonna go on your shoulder. And actually it can fit the straw over the dowel rod, okay? And I can now slide it on the bow and it really is gonna help the students get a bow that's parallel to the bridge while they're waiting and I'm cleaning up these violins. And if they squeeze, I can't move. If I squeeze with my thumb, I can't, I can't get the straw. So it gives them that immediate kinesthetic feedback. Again, for the cello and the bass, you can bring this down and make sure it's parallel to the floor or where their bridge would be. And then that's gonna work really, I think, beautifully. Okay, I'm going to go back into screen share really quick. I just have a few more things to show and then John Ryan, I'll let you field some questions for me. Does that sound good? Yep, sounds good. I already have a few. Okay. I'm going to hit share and play from current slides. So um, I sent this to Dr. Zabinal. He can send it out to you. Um, those are the most important things in the kit. 
So the last thing I wanted to show you were all these videos. Them. Rebecca, we're losing you, just so you know. This is... Oh no! I hope she's okay. Let's, let's, oh, okay, I'm oh back. you're back, you're back, okay, good. Okay, great, yeah, we lost you right when you got to this new slide. Oh, I think she's frozen again. Okay, I'm back. I got kicked off. Oh, okay. Can we you hear me now? We hear you yes. great. We see you great. We lost you when the uh, when you got to the new slide. Yeah, my internet just totally went out. But I think this is our new our new real reality. New All right, here's my YouTube channel. This is free. Um, I made I posted a Facebook. If you're if you're friends with me, if you're not friends with me, friend me. Um, no, and I, I made the pun, no strings attached. I, this is whatever it's free, use it. I just want people to have it. So one of the issues that we have, oh, we have so many issues outside of COVID-19. So I'm just going to take a brief two minutes here for a quick talk about issues in diversity. Um, string music education music education and our society is really has issues with equity and systemic racism and the string world is one of those places that because of the emphasis that was historically and has been historically placed on classical music and I love classical music and I will continue teaching classical music, but because we've been so centered, so absolutely white centric in our profession and our practice, that there are so few role models, people of color who are teaching instruments, because our history has been so focused on this tradition the materials we use to teach, the repertoire we use to teach, the methods we use to teach, the way we think, the way we set up our classroom, the pedagogy, I mean, it's pretty much everything we do, um, we are going to have to revisit. It's really important when we look at the string teaching community, and I think via the Nat King Cole Foundation is one of the most important places to start having this conversation. When we look at the string community and the professional string community, it is still really predominantly white. In the late 1980s, professional orchestras began doing blind auditions. And when that happened, the demographic of the professional orchestra changed to include more minorities and more women. Um, but think about how late that was in the game. Um, string instruments are actually unbelievably diverse. They can be found across cultures and in a wide variety of music. And string teachers have this unbelievable opportunity to really engage, I believe, everyone. But we do need to think about what we're including in our classrooms who we're including, who is joining our classroom, and then who isn't joining our classroom. And if your classroom looks different than the school in which you teach, it's worth reflecting and wondering why the classroom looks that way. Um, and this conversation deserves its own week and year and probably decades. So my two minutes is really inadequate. But it's something that we've been working in my community on at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. And 12 years ago now, we started a program in a really diverse community. And now some of those students are actually music majors at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Some of my alumni are on this call. Hi, all. We just got a grant to create a diverse music learning community online 
for young people made by young people and this is part of my YouTube channel I'm also on my YouTube channel but I did want to share with you the open string blues this is designed specifically for beginners and specifically to have young people of diverse backgrounds teaching other young people and the idea is to provide peer assisted learning so that younger people can be inspired and motivated by people that maybe they um, feel like they have more to relate to, be it ethnicity or age. So here's our open string blues. Hi pals, my name is Maggie and I'm here to help you learn how to play the open string blues. So let's grab our violins and let's begin. We're gonna take our violins put it across ourselves, take our left hand, put it on top of the body of our instrument, take our right hand, get our index finger and put it under the fingerboard and keep our thumb up. This is what we're gonna use to pluck. So let's learn the notes of the song. We're gonna pluck each of our open strings four times. And let's say those open strings just to make sure we know them. It goes E, A, D, G. And now we're gonna pluck them four times. Can you say it with me? One, two, let's go. E, 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 A, 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 B, 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 G, D, D, D. Great okay. job. Let's do that again. But let's just I'm gonna let you watch most of the rest of this on your own. But the other thing I brought up was this concept of getting to feel like you're playing along in real time with something. So at the end of our instructional tracks, we invite the student to play with our online orchestra. One, two, let's start with E. Okay, I got it off. All right. Woo. So, Re Re Rebecca, I, I don't know if you had any more after this, but we do have a few questions. No, too. I'm ready for questions. I do want to say that I wish that gal that was teaching that song was a music ed major, but I'm here to tell you she's studying biology. Oh, nuts. <laughs> oh, that's so upsetting. All right. So one of our first questions, well, first of all, some of the, Thank you very much for you know taking the t taking the time out of your day to go ahead and, and share all this with us. You were you were talking about instrument cleaning. I just wanted to share that William Harris Lee tomorrow will be presenting on on instrument cleaning or how to handle instruments. So he may be to answer some of these questions. But the I think that's way better. Yeah. So, but one question was: Could a Nor Norwex cloth remove the virus from the varnish of the instruments? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think the 
what I've read is that it, it, whatever it is that's going to kill or, or fully remove the virus is above 70% alcohol or, or there's like three different, different kind of virus killing chemicals. And of those, the ones that truly kill the virus, they will also damage the varnish. Yeah. And they haven't come up with, with something that kills it yet that um, is like not so harsh. It's just the nature. It's the same thing when we're dealing with the hand sanitizers or any, any other agent. In order for it to kill the virus, it, it has to have a certain percentage of those, those types of chemicals. Yeah, uh, and so another question relating to, well, I'm just gonna read this verbatim. For middle school and high school students who are used to a majority of the year being concert focused, how do you recommend structuring the year and recruiting students where performances may not be possible? So again, the, I think the ask to COVID guidelines help with this a lot. I'm facing that for my university. And what I'm focused on with my university group or trying to design for them are some online modules that, that allow them to engage in music making, either by themselves or with others and a lot of it is product oriented but it's not like a large ensemble concert so for, for instance and this is the choices i've made i've engaged some people in my community so one of our modules is actually doing indian music and we're going to learn rogs and we're going to learn the matras and it's not my expertise so i've engaged someone else so i'm really recommending that people exchange expertise with other you know friends or people that you have and the end product is going to be them performing um but probably not in a group together they may get together in a small group and do their own choice of video production but what what i'm not going to do and this is just me I'm not gonna do all of that audio production because we know that those virtual ensembles completely rob the teacher of all time. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's nice to have that product, but it's gonna, it's gonna take you, unless you can engage your students in that level of video production and audio production, I mean, hours. And the student's experience is gonna be one with a click track with the headphones on. So, the, the feeling of the ASTA team was kind of that if students are going to be part of a virtual performance, in order for it to be really educationally meaningful for them, they actually need to be contributing to the production. So that leads me to another one. I am thinking about putting my students in small groups of four to five and having them produce their own play along tracks the whole way to the end where they might put it out online if I approve it. And then they will be engaging in, you know, listening to themselves, making sure the audio is lining up. And there are some softwares that do that. The free one, um, I need to find that free one. Why don't you tell me, or I got it actually. Um, it's called Up. Beats? No, that's not it either. I'll see if I can find it and I'll put it out in the, the chat. Yeah, no, no, that sounds good and I can send it out. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other questions and I'm putting them together. Would you be open to me sending, emailing you the questions and we can go ahead and post it on a, on a web page? Yeah. Somewhere? All right, sounds good. Um, yeah. Some other people in the chat. Are, are telling me in, in the chat, oh, there's an upbeat music app, um, there's upbeatmusicapp.com or BandLab, that's another BandLab um, materials in there as well. But one quick question that really relates to you, your presentation specifically, would you uh, consider sending directions to families for your starter kit? He, this person said that they start around 150 students on violin violas and can't imagine putting those together no, packets for that, their students. Yeah. If I had that many students, I would either ask parents to put together with their leftover cereal boxes because they are items you can mostly find in your home. But it, I, I would consider, um, so how many am I going to have? I'm not going to have 150. 
I'm probably gonna have a few and I can co see I can co-opt help from my undergraduates but you might be able to co-opt help from high school kids um, but what I was gonna say I would invest in are the straw and the dowel rod if I if I, if I were only gonna send home two things I would send home a dowel rod and a straw and I don't think I said this um, very clearly but I'm not going to give my students their instrument until they graduate or show me proficiency on with their body format and I'm also going to design some musicianship activities. I'm probably going to ask them all to get a tennis ball at home and engage in some rhythmic activities and other general music activities while they're building their bow holds before I have them pick up their instrument. So there's going to be a whole sequence that, that I'm advocating for. All right, no, that sounds great. Again, thank you for, for the, your time and thank you for you know sharing your experiences with us. It's such a crazy time and there's so much, you, the ambiguity of it all is, can be anxiety producing, especially when you have 150, 200, even 75 students in your program. So thank you very much. It's so much. I did want to share, you probably all need a break, but I wanted to, somebody kindly sent this to me in the chat. This is the, I know there's so many software apps and I'm not, trying to market anything I have no nothing in this no horse in this show but it's called upbeatmusicapp.com and the and the reason I I'm looking at this right now is because it is free like just completely free students can access it and they can record um, in their own separate areas like from their home right there within that particular app. They don't have to record and then send it in and then produce it. I don't think it's a replacement for a lot of things, but I do think it provides an opportunity for them to have discussions, make decisions, and record together.